Hi everyone, I'm Francesco Penta and I'm a principal cloud support engineer here at AWS and I'm based out of Dublin, Ireland. Welcome to AWS Supports You, where we share best practices and troubleshooting tips from AWS support. Joining me today is Seth and Johnny from AWS support. Can you give us a quick introduction, Seth and Johnny? Yeah, sure, Francesco. Thank you. Uh, my name is Seth Elliott. I am the principal uh, reliability solutions architect with AWS Well Architected. Been in that role for about three years here at AWS, working globally with customers all over the world on the reliability and resiliency challenges. And before that, I've spent about seven years in various roles, uh, principal engineering roles, SA roles with Amazon.com, most recently as an AWS solutions architect with Amazon.com, working with their uh, engineers all over the world on how they use AWS to deliver the Amazon.com experience to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Hanley. I have been working at AWS for a little over six years. I'm currently a solutions architect on the well-architected team, but I've had other roles as well, uh, TAMs and, and solutions architect roles. I've been working with many different customers of all sizes and all verticals and super excited to talk reliability with you today. Thank you, Seth and Johnny. So today we will be talking about designing for reliability with the AWS Well-Architected Framework. But before we get into the details, a quick note to the attendees online. Feel free to use the chat window on the right-hand side on your screen to let us know where you're joining us from today and share your thoughts and questions throughout the episode. We look forward to hearing from you. With that said, Johnny, can you walk us through what we're going to be talking about today? Absolutely. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to start off talking a little bit about well-architected, and then specifically, we're going to talk about reliability today. We're going to dive into best practices. We're going to do a cool chaos engineering demo, and then we're going to circle back and talk about key takeaways and helpful resources. And as always, we're going to answer your questions anytime throughout the presentation. So like Francesco said, if you have questions, please put them into the chat. We will try to pause from time to time to circle back and make sure we're answering all your questions. And now let's go ahead and get started. This is our CTO, Werner Vogels, and he has a quote that says, we needed to build systems that embrace failure as a natural occurrence. So what does that mean? What he's talking about here is that he always likes to say that Everything fails all the time, but you can't have your workload fail all the time. So what we need to do is we need to architect around component failures to provide resiliency. And we're going to talk a lot more into how to do that throughout today's session. So let's move forward and, and chat about it. So we talked about what is well-architected. We said we'd talk about it. Well-architected is a framework that AWS has put together based on best practices and their experience from all of the customers over the years. And so we've learned what are the best practices in the cloud. We wanna take that learning and we wanna be able to measure your architecture against that learning. So we go through and we're gonna show you some examples of the well-architected tool and other ways to, to try to compare your architectural workloads against the best practices and try to find out what things you're doing really well and then areas that you could improve. And then the next step is to take that improvement and to go ahead and take, take that improvement and go ahead and work through it in your architecture. So the well-architected framework is actually, a, it's a flywheel, it's a continuous improvement. So that takes us into the pillars of AWS Well Architected. And so there's six pillars, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and the new pillar that's been added is sustainability. Today, we're gonna to focus on reliability. So let's go ahead and dive into that. This is a picture of the Well-Architected tool. The Well-Architected tool is in the console for everyone to use. It's a free tool and available to all. So what we've basically done is we've taken the framework and we've broken it down into a subset of questions. So you can walk through, it's kind of a guided exercise that helps you walk through and discover all the different things you're doing well and all the things that you have areas for improvement based on the best practices of the Well-Architected Framework. So in this example here, you can see we have a couple of questions in the reliability pillar. You see there's some check boxes there. Those are associated with best practices. So as you go through, you answer the question and then conversationally with your team and SAs or other AWS or partners, 
you'll have a discussion about how your workload is architected and then whether or not specifically each of the best practices is currently in place. And if it is, you'll check the box. And it is, if it is not, you'll go ahead and leave the box unchecked. What will happen is you'll be able to then run reports and get a lot of data about the different best practices that are in place and areas that you could improve. So let's move forward and dive a little bit deeper into some of these other areas on the next slide. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to talk about reliability and resiliency. Now, these seem very similar, and they are very intertwined, as you'll see, but they're subtly different. Reliability is the ability of a workload to perform its required function correctly and consistently. So we want to perform as expected all the time. And resiliency is the ability of a workload to recover from infrastructure or service disruptions. So what we were talking about before, resiliency needs to be built in so that your workload can be reliable. So whenever there's a component failure that you're dependent on, you automatically can recover and contain, continue to maintain your reliability. And we're going to talk more about ways to do that as we go further through today's session. As we go forward on the next slide, we're going to talk some more about the best practices. So I'm going to hand this off. Well, first, I'm going to pause and see if we have any questions. I'm going to ask Francesco if there's any questions that we should be answering. Um, Hi. Uh, no question at the moment, but I have a couple of questions for you. Um, OK. So the first one that I hear a lot from customers is always uh, what's the difference between the well-architected framework and the well-architected tool? Aren't they the same thing? Awesome question. So the well-architected framework is the conceptual framework, not to use the same word again, of all of the best practices. And so what we've done is we've started with some design principles. We start with the five pillars or the six now that we talked about, and then we break those down into design principles. And then based on those design principles, there's sets of questions that we have that help us to determine whether or not a workload is utilizing the best practices. The tool is a specific way to go through. It's that survey that we, that conversation that we have to figure out those questions, whether or not we're doing those best practices. I like to think of the framework as a, as kind of a philosophical perspective. We want to make sure that we're thinking about this throughout our organization. We're thinking of it holistically as a life cycle of improvement, right? And then the tool is just a way to go ahead and fulfill that flush those risks out to the surface, continuously improve, and we continue that flywheel. At Amazon, we'd love to talk about our flywheels. Perfect. Thank you, Johnny. Can I add so, to that, actually? Um, so yeah, I mean, what Johnny said, everything's true. Uh, that's an awesome answer. Uh, the tool is out there. Yeah, you could use it. You could uh, review your workloads against the best practices. But the framework itself is more than just those questions and best practices. Uh, there's a white paper for every pillar. So you can read about the best practices in the white paper, and it goes in much more detail than it does in the tool, because in the tool, you're doing a review. There's not space for a lot of text and diagrams. So, and even if you're not like a person that wants to sit down and read a 80 page white paper, the white paper is in HTML form. So you could literally pop it up and deep link to whatever is important to you and just review that section. But in addition to the white paper, there's also labs, well architected labs. And, and what, what, later when we do our demo, it's gonna be a demo of one of those labs where you could learn about these best practices by really hands being hands on. Perfect, and thank you very much. And uh, Robert Tables was mentioning that uh, it's all the things that you don't didn't know that you had to do or not to do. So it's a great guide that you can have in uh, understanding more about workload and what you should do to make it reliable. The other question I wanted to ask before we move to the next um, section is uh, something that I get from customers quite a, a bit as well. Um, so is the well-architected framework um, um, just for new workloads or can I use it with existing workloads or applications? So the well-architected framework is designed to be able to meet you where you are. In an ideal world, we would go ahead and, and we would want to get as early in the development cycle as possible. So even when you're just conceiving your workloads, you want to start thinking about the best practices. You want to try to design with all of this in mind. And it's a lot easier to do that. Much like when you're building a house, you want to lay the foundation and, and put all the things into place when it's easiest. When you're doing that with best practices, it's the same thing for building the architecture of a workload. Now, having said that, anytime you're thinking about best practices is the right time to think about best practices. So if you are already in production, 
then it's it's better than not doing it. So I would say wherever you are in the life cycle of your workload, please take the time to consider the best practices and learn from the the people that have come before you. But you will get the most impact out of it the earlier in this life cycle that you can bring the best practices into play. Perfect. Thank you very much. Johnny, am I taking it over from here? You are. It's time for right. an awesome demo. This is like a well old machine. Well, demos at the end. Wait. Oh, uh, they're, right. they're clipping. That's keeping them right. keeping right. them in their seats and keeping them here throughout the whole thing so we could share with them. Uh, hi, folks. Welcome back. <laughs> um, so anyway, I want to dive into some of those best practices, uh, and Johnny's going to share some with you too. Uh, so the way we do uh, best practices in Well Architected is we divide them into these areas. And there's four areas that we're going to talk to you about today in the reliability best practices. The first area, of which is foundations. And then within those areas, we divide the best divide the best practices into questions. You saw when Johnny shared with you that screenshot of the well-architected tool, it showed in the form of questions. So uh, the question answer format is really great for reviews, but it's also how we tend to organize. So the question is uh, sort of a, a subtopic. And then the answers to that question are checkboxes, yes or no. Are you doing these best practices or are you not doing them? So under foundations, there are two questions. The first one is around service quotas and limits. Now, you might not have heard the phrase quotas before. Basically, it's kind of another way to say limits. It focuses more on what is the limit that's set in your AWS account or what's the limit set in your in your, in, in your your workload. All right. So it's, quotas are more about something that you know is set and is either changeable or not changeable, but it's, it's, a, it's a fixed amount that you know about versus like we still talk about limits, but limits might still be more about like things you that are not explicitly set, but are implicitly set, like the speed of light, like if you're talking about latency between different uh, endpoints or, or even just uh, constraints in your network infrastructure. So there are quotas and there are limits. And, and around the best practices around there is A, know what they are. Uh, if you don't know your quotas, you don't know that you're going to accidentally hit them when you're operating in production and have some sort of outage or non-availability event. And then raise those quotas where necessary. It, it kind of goes with the knowing your quotas, but either ahead of time or dynamically have a way to understand what your quotas are and when you're going to need to raise them and when you need to lower them again. Now, the reason they exist is as a protection mechanism, right? Because the, the cloud is elastic, right? You could like with the right inputs expand out to, to use, you know, many, many resources. So you have those quotas in place to protect yourself when you don't want to use all those resources, but you also want the quotas out of the way when you need those resources. And then the hard limits I talked about, speed of light, networking, infrastructure, things like that. Understand where you need to work around those. Okay, the question two, rel two, is around network topology. Uh, and I forgot to mention foundations refers to, the reason they're called foundations because they don't apply just to one workload, but might apply to many workloads. So well architected is generally focused on a workload, but the foundational stuff is stuff in there that's in your account, in your, uh, in your, in your, uh, on, in, in, and in the cloud, essentially, in how your cloud's configured, that might affect multiple workloads. So network topology is another one of those things, right? We want to make sure you're using highly available endpoints to onboard uh, customers or other services onto your system. So whether you're using something like an elastic load balance or an API gateway or using Route 53, which is not technically endpoint, but it defines your endpoints because it's um, DNS system, so it defines your domain names. So you want to use these highly available systems to define your endpoints. You want to have redundancy for high reliability. So if you're connecting between things, have more than one connection. Uh, a good example of that is if you need to collect on-premises, you could use uh, a direct connect. It's called a direct connect. That's the AWS service. And we want you to have at least two of those. If you have only one of those, you're, you're running some risk there. And then the size and layout of your network. Do you have enough IP addresses? Do you have enough capacity, et cetera? So for each of these, we're going to show a slide with each of the questions and just sort of dive into a couple of the best practices. Uh, in this case, I'm going to talk about quotas. Now, this is the quotas dashboard within the AWS console. So within the quotas dashboard is sort of this one pane of glass where you can see what your quotas are. Remember, quotas are these preset limits uh, around many different AWS services you might be running. You see Athena, DynamoDB, Elastic Block Store, many, many more that are not shown on the screen. I'm going to double click on Lambda. There's a lot of people. Lambda is our serverless running code uh, without servers, our serverless functionality. And you can see here that concurrent executions is set to 1,000, but there's a little uh, you know, a little checkbox next to it. I could raise that. So concurrent executions is how many lambdas I have running at a given time. You know, If I have 1,000 requests come in before any of them complete, it's going to spin up 1,000 lambdas. That's my maximum, but I could raise that. But there are things I can't raise, like the, um, like the payload. Uh, the payload is going to be 256 kilobytes for 
asynchronous Lambda, I think it's six megabytes for synchronous Lambda. That's something that they're not, we're not going to let you change. So you have to just be aware of it. And uh, networking. So this is Transit Gateway. Uh, we had, Transit Gateway was introduced a couple of years ago. Prior to that, we did have something, we still have something called VPC peering. So we want to connect two VPCs on the same network, sharing the same IP address range. You could do that with VPC peering. And that works great for connecting two VPCs. It might even be okay for connecting three VPCs. But when you get to like 10 VPCs, you'd create this many-to-many -many mesh that would be very hard to maintain. So Transit Gateway provides a central hub where you can connect all those VPs, VPCs through a single transit gateway. It also lets you connect to Direct Connect, which again goes to on-premises, or VPNs, which can go to on-premises or other, other uh, clouds. So you have lots of different options there. Using a transit gateway gives you this nice, neat uh, network topology. All right, and with that, um, that concludes the foundations area. Any Are there any questions on the foundations before we go into the other best practices? Um, thank you, Seth. And uh, no, no questions at the moment, but I do still have a question for you here. Um, the transit gateway and VPC peering is another argument that comes quite a lot with customers. And uh, should we always use transit gateway or are there use cases where VPC peering would be okay to use? I think if you're connecting two VPCs, VPC peering is an obvious good choice. Transit gateway, uh, and you don't need to connect to you know, direct connect or VPN, then VPC peering is going to be a great option. The question is when you get past two, when you get to three, four, five, where is that crossover? And I can't answer that specifically. What I can say is uh, there'll become a point where uh, managing that many VPC peerings might be difficult. Why wouldn't you just go to transit gateway right away? Well, a couple of reasons. Transit gateway does have a cost um associated with it while vpc peering is free so you have to decide when it's worth it to be paying for that functionality um and as i said uh you'd be able to connect to things like direct connects or vpns uh that's transit gateway is going to be your solution there so there's going to be a crossover point you know somewhere between you know three and ten there's going to be a crossover point where you want to consider transit gateway instead of just going with vpc peering and thank you, Seth. And it definitely um, depends on your, your architecture and what you're building and what your needs, and especially thinking about how you're going to grow uh, when using those services. So one thing with the VPC peering is that you cannot do transitive uh, traffic in between different VPCs, which is something that uh, Transit Gateway will allow you to do. So yeah, hence the complexity that Seth was mentioning when you have multiple VPCs that need to talk with each other, you need to carefully plan everything and it becomes really, really hard once you cross a certain number of VPCs. Yeah, it's not transit. So that's what I meant to say when it become many to many. You can imagine taking yep. a bunch of VPCs on the screen and connecting each one to each other one, and it becomes that many to many mesh, which gets complicated. I guess the other thing is Transit Gateway does introduce an extra hop. It's going to be pretty low latency, but if you're really, really concerned about you know latency at, at the nth degree, then that extra hop might be something to consider also. Exactly. And you might want also to architect your workload to be same as E for those latency sensitive workloads. It becomes, it really depends on the, and on the architecture of your application. What are your requirements? Um, I posted a link to a white paper uh, that discussed the um, building scalable networks with the transit gateway versus VPC peering, if you're interested in looking at a bit more. But again, thank you very much for your answer set and uh, back to you. All right, the next section we're going to talk about is workload architecture. So now this is workload specific. And when we say workload architecture, we mean usually the software focused architecture. There's some infrastructure pieces here too, but focusing on those software best practices that are going to keep your workload resilient. So uh, RHEL 3 is really about choosing what is actually going to be the structure of your of your workload, of your distributed system. Uh, anything from, you know, you can create anything from, from these monoliths to uh, service-oriented architecture, to microservices, you know, finding the right balance and how you map up the individual services to various business domains is going to be your first step. Uh, RHEL 4 is about, and RHEL 5, about preventing and mitigating failures, respectively, different kinds of practices you could do in your software. Uh, preventing failures, we include things like loosely coupled dependencies. Instead of just having your client call directly into an EC2 instance, go through an elastic load balancer. Or consider using SQS, our queuing service, to actually queue up requests and have a fleet of EC2 instances or ECS tasks or, or, or you know, or EKS pods to pick up those requests. And that creates a loose coupling where a request is not is picked up and something fails and something else can pick it up. You don't, you don't have that hard dependency there. Item potency means every request, uh, if you issue the same request multiple times, it has the same result. It doesn't actually accumulate, which is really great if you're operating in an environment where you might have some 
unreliable requests where you might get them more than once and you just want to just do it the one time. Um, mitigating failures, graceful degradation is a lot of, that's about um, if you're, there's a couple of things actually. If you have a dependency that your service calls and that dependency becomes unreliable, how do you react? I mean, one way to react is say, I called this dependency, it gave me an error, so I'm gonna pass an error back up the line. That's not great for reliability. What we'd like you to do is be intelligent about it, recognize that error and, and say, can I do something different? Can I serve a static response? Can I serve some sort of cache response? Uh, graceful degradation also comes into play if you're experiencing high load and things are starting to get overloaded. Uh, like I know that some websites will start to like uh, restrict traffic from certain sources, like no more robots and instead only accept traffic from actual users. Um, Throttle and throttling, failing fast, limiting retries. So, you know, that's again also about how do you, when failures are about to happen or in the in the process of happening, when things are overloaded, how does your software react? You know, being able to throttle requests and send back actual uh, messaging. What is it? Uh, which code is that? 427, whatever that, too many requests or um, sending back intelligent requests instead of falling over uh, is going to be very important. So diving into this a little, I mentioned monoliths to SOA to microservices. So monoliths are the kind of old school, I mean, there are people out there, I'm sure they still have monolithic architectures, um, but they're kind of the old school, one giant binary contains all of the business logic. And that becomes kind of unwieldy after a while, right? You might have multiple teams owning different business logic, all having to check in to the same, not only the same code base, but the same literal binary that's compiled together and has to be deployed together. It limits agility. So folks have moved to service-oriented architectures where each application is part of a distributed uh, workload. Each has its own service talking to each other. And then microservices are where you take that to a next level. So each function has its own service. You might have the CRUD operations for a certain record handled by a microservice. As, and they're not exclusive. SOA and microservices are not exclusive. It's not an either or choice, right? So each of those little squares under service architecture can consist of multiple microservices itself. And so it's something to consider when you're putting together your service. And then why are microservices or just even SOA? Why are smaller services better? Well, number one is you could deploy them independently, which again gives you greater agility. I could deploy my service as long as I'm not changing my interface in a breaking way without having to deploy everybody else's services and be and be assured that's still going to work. I could also scale my services differently. I could scale some services up and other services down. Uh, if you're using either reserved instances or savings plans in AWS, and you have what's called an AWS organization, which is multiple accounts being managed, you can actually share those across multiple accounts and across multiple services so that uh, you can maintain the, the cost savings of a savings plan uh, or reserved instances while then not wasting any of your instances, right? One, one service gives them up, another service takes those, takes those off your hands. All right, so yeah, any questions on the, on the uh, workload architecture section? Uh, no, no question from the audience uh, right now, uh, Seth. Um, one question I do have for you, though, is about you mentioned graceful degradation and how that will work. Uh, can you expand a bit on the concept, please? Yeah. So graceful degradation is about how do I actually present an experience to my user that's still acceptable or even good without rather than just simply failing to operate. So the most famous example is personalization, right? Amazon.com is personalization. Netflix is personalization. All these sites have personalization to show you things you think you'd like. But if the personalization service doesn't work, do you want to fail and like just show a blank page? No, you could actually show a static page or a page that you know is, pers is, is uh, things that are popular in that area. Um, another example is, uh, let's take the Amazon.com detail page. That's the page you go to buy stuff, right? Um, on that page is a lot of stuff. There's an image, there's a title, there's a description, there's a price, there's ratings, I mean, there's reviews, there's ratings, there's all kinds of things. But the way that's architected that is that if any of those things fails, let's say the rating system for some reason is failing and doesn't show you ratings, it can still show you the title and the price and the description. So you could still make a purchasing decision if you want. And there's probably a lot of things on those pages that are important to certain people, but only at certain times that you might not even miss if they're not there. So that's the ability to gracefully degrade the experience. It's a, not a full experience, but it's still presenting, presenting experience where customers can actually shop and do their thing.
Perfect. Thank you, Seth. And uh, yeah, it's a, one thing that you can do when you have independent systems or at least all microservices that can fail. Um, I've linked a link to a recent solution that we released, which is the AWS virtual waiting room that takes on the concept to next level. So basically the virtual waiting room is something that you can use to buffer incoming requests to your website and basically put people in a queue to avoid overloading the website when you have high burst of traffic, which basically extending the concept to something um, rather than gracefully degrading a system, you're trying to put users uh, in a queue as they're waiting resources in your system to free up. So again, expanding on this uh, um, uh, concept. Um, it's a full solution that you can use and uh, I've posted a link there if you want to have a look and then look at how it works and um, you can look at the how it was implemented and how to implement that in your systems as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like it, it, it's a form of, of graceful degradation that I, as a user, don't want to be in a waiting room. I'd rather be buying my my ticket or my thing yep. now. But you've given me this experience where I'm in a waiting room and I'm well informed and I understand that I will eventually have my my ability to, to buy my buy my stuff. So it's a great example. All right. So let's go into the third area. So we've covered foundations and workload architecture. Let's talk about change management. So change management also has three questions, each with their own best practices. The one, first one is to monitor your workload resources because you can't manage what you can't see. Make sure you have the monitoring in place to understand when you're approaching limits of your capacity to handle traffic, when are you uh, actually seeing danger signs where things are going to fail. Do you have synthetic uh, probes in place, maybe using CloudWatch synthetics as what we call canary, running certain, running through certain APIs and looking for responses. And if it sees a certain error right there, it's giving you a signal that there might, you, you need to take action to, to proactively address an issue that might cause a reliability outage. Um, role seven, adapt to changes in demand. This is the ability, this is the elasticity of the cloud, right? This is, this is the great thing about the cloud. You can scale out when you need it, scale back when you don't need it, uh, and use that and do that in an automated fashion. And role eight is about implementing change, uh, specifically around deployments, you know, deployment of code, deployment of configuration, deployment of infrastructure. Deployment is probably the most dangerous time for your workload, right? That's when things are changing and you wanna actually ensure, ensure that you're not gonna have any kind of negative consequence to that. You need to be able to change things. That's that's agility, right? You wanna be continuously building, continuously deploying. And so there's ways to mitigate those negative impacts. Talking about auto-scaling first. Uh, so, you know, you can define an auto-scaling group uh, where you actually have a minimum size, a maximum size, a desired capacity, and then you can set certain uh, metrics to look at, you know, CPU or, or network. And, and based on those, scale up or scale down. There's a few different kinds of scaling policies you can implement. There's one that's sort of like a thermostat where you try to maintain a metric like CPU at a certain value and you'll scale up and scale down to achieve it. There's another one where you're just scaling up based on how far your alarm goes above and scaling back based on how far your alarm goes below. And it's not just about scaling EC2 instances. You could scale uh, ECS tasks. You could scale DynamoDB throughput. You could scale uh, replicas on your database if you're using Amazon Aurora. So auto scaling comes into play in a lot of places. Even even it, it's not called auto scaling, but Lambda essentially does auto scaling. Like I talked about before, the more requests you get that need to be served, it'll scale up the number of Lambda instances out there uh, up to your concurrency limits. So auto scaling is very powerful. And then change. Change is a dangerous uh, uh, time for your service. And deployment is a time of change. So this is showing you a, a good a set of several good best practices around your deployment. Number one is uh, developers are constantly making small changes, not huge, large, earth-shattering check-ins. And those changes are constantly being integrated and tested into your code base, not necessarily being deployed to production, but constantly being integrated and built. Uh, now that's the green area. So on the orange area on the right, this is where we talk about a pre-production stage called mid-stage here and a production stage. So this is where you're now actually uh, flipping the script, uh, being fast is important, but quality is more important. So you're going to have what's uh, called a set of pessimistic rules and tests. That means that any failure of any of those tests will cause a rollback to the previous uh, stage. So it's not going to go out the door. And then you can see on the right where it lists multiple fleets. If you're in multiple regions, uh, this is actually taken from amazon.com. If you're multiple regions, then you're not going to roll them all out to the same fleet at once. You're going to roll it out to a fleet at a time, but even then you're not going to roll it out to the entire fleet. You're going to roll it out first to what's called a one box. A one box can be literally a single server, but what it means is a, a, a small subset of your, of your deployment, uh, footprint. You deploy the new code to that and you monitor it very critically. You, you have a lot of monitors on there, a lot of 
uh, alarms on there. And if anything uh, goes awry, if there's any alarms there, you immediately roll it back. This is a way to get exposed to real production traffic at production scale with production diversity while mitigating your risk. So this is a couple of different best practices around, around deployment. Any questions? And that, that that's what we want to talk about, change management. For the fourth area of failure management, I'm going to hand it over to Johnny, but any questions? Hey, Seth. Yes, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is from JibJab06. Um, he's asking, is auto-scaling always reactive? Um, in the example, scaling up when he sees higher load? Thank you for chip job. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. I talked about reactive auto scaling. I said you see CPU or you see uh, network load and you scale up to accommodate. Not always, no. There is a uh, time-based auto scaling. So if you know that you actually, you know, during the day you see more traffic and during the night you see less traffic, you can set a schedule to scale up during the day and scale back during the night. You could adjust that schedule however you want. And AWS also has something called predictive auto scaling. This is making use of machine learning. It again is based on a metric but it's going to immediately start learning based on that metric to see to anticipate in advance instead of waiting for that metric to spike it's going to it's going to auto scale you out or in based on what it thinks that metric is going to do based on what it's done before so that's another way to take advantage of auto scaling without being completely reactive perfect thank you Seth. we also have another question from code with sean um is there is there any way to take existing resources and dump them to cloud formation Oh, okay. Yeah. So not ex yes and no. Uh, they did add a, a functionality, and Johnny, feel free to jump in on this if you want, where you could actually create cloud formation templates from existing resources, but you actually have to, you can, you, it's a way to manage existing resources with cloud formation. You still actually have to put the, uh, the, the resources into a template and then say, okay, here's my template, match it to this thing I already have in production, and now you're managing it. But I, as for taking it from production and creating a new template, I, I don't think so. Uh, well, uh, you, you also have uh, uh, there's a um, Cloudformer cloud that, that can be used. Um, yeah, don't talk uh, about Cloudformer. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's an officially supported tool anymore. No, it's it's not, not not really officially supported. They're it doesn't also seem to work very well. I would you know even look at it. Are there, are there probably third party tools that? Do yeah, that? yeah, there are third party tools that will do yeah. that as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have another question from Robert Tables. Uh, nice Bobby Tables. <laughs> Conceptually, <laughs> how does this one box canary and rollback situation work with Lambda using version aliases or something else? Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. In in the um, I know you can do that. Actually, you can do blue green deployments with Lambda. You can actually set it to uh, deploy new code to a um, percent of your Lambdas out there, and then scale up with time. There actually are these these scaling policies you can use with Lambda to do these kinds of deployments. I know the serverless toolkit does it. That's what I was trying to think. Serverless toolkit is a um, is, is a is code for uh, a cloud formation like capability that works with serverless and Lambda. And it's also compatible with cloud formation. I know within the serverless toolkit, there are different deployment policies you can use that do that. Yes. Perfect. That's all from the audience right now. Thank you very much for the answer set. All right, awesome. All right, Johnny, take it away. All right, so moving on, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about failure management. And essentially, here what we want to do is we want to start to think about, you know, what could go wrong, and if something did go wrong, how would we ensure that our workload is going to continue to have the resilience that we need for the consistency that we expect? And so, reliability nine is talking about backing up your data. Backing up the data, obviously, with the expectation that you're going to be able to restore that data in the event of some kind of a, an event. And so the first thing we have to do is we try to identify which data do we have to back up. And so we, we want to start with the workload and we want to work backwards from there. What are the, the business outcomes? And if something were to be to an event to happen, which individual things can we go without and which individual things do we absolutely need to restore? And so we're identifying our data to back it up. And then once we've done that, we want to go ahead and automate that. And we want to secure that backup because it's not enough to just run a backup job, but we got to make sure that it's going to be there when we need it. So securing who can access it and making sure it doesn't get deleted and then automating it to make sure that it's consistently going to be running. And then every time we, we need it, we can expect it to be there. In Reliability 10, we're talking about fault isolation. And essentially here, what we're talking about is if something were to go wrong, we want to make sure as we have many, many components and we have redundancies built in, we want to make sure that that fault is isolated to one subsection that we can, we can 
have a failure and still overcome it, right? We're talking about building, building resiliency, and this is one of the ways we do it. And we do it using multiple sites. Multi we use AWS regions, availability zones. We're going to talk more about those in a few moments. We're going to dive into that a lot deeper. So hold on that for a second. But the whole purpose of that, we dive deeper into reliability 11, is to be able to withstand component failures, right? We want to make sure that no matter what fails on an individual component level, that we still have a workload that's functioning and that the customer experience does not get degraded. And so with withstanding component failures, the things we start to think about are, if something were to go wrong, how would I recover? And then I take that recovery and I build a runbook. Right. This is what's going to happen when I recover. And then what I ideally do is automate that. I want to automate that runbook so that whenever that failure happens in a component, I automatically recover. And I want to couple that with notifications. I want to make sure that I'm notifying the proper people that this event has happened. And in the ideal scenario, as ideal as a failure could be, you might be asleep in the middle of the night. One component or many components fail. You have an automatic recovery. You get a notification, whether it be to uh, an email or some other notification mechanism. You wake up in the morning, you look, you notice something failed, but you also notice that it recovered. You have all the information you need to do a deep dive retrospective on what happened, try to figure out what went well, and then areas that you can improve. And so this is this is a really good thing to to try to work for because things will fail. So we want to make sure that when individual components fail, our architecture allows our workload to still be operational at the expected level. So we're going to move on to the next slide and we're going to talk a little bit more, like I promised, on the AWS regions and availability zones. So regions are physical locations around the world and there are many, many regions and they are continuously being added in AWS. So you can go and you can you can look that up online and get the, the latest version of how many regions there are and where the new ones are being planned. And as we dive deeper into that, clicking through the slide, you'll see we're going to talk about each region is made of many availability zones. So availability zones, as we continue to click through, we're going to break this down into each AZ is more discrete data centers, right? So we have, we start at the high level. We have a region, which is geographical in nature. We break that down into AZs, which are going to be essentially clusters of data centers operating as one. And they're going to be in availability zones. And our availability zones are designed to do that fault isolation we were talking about. So each availability zone is comprised of many data centers each with redundant power, redundant networking, and connectivity. And these are going to be housed in separate facilities. And the availability zones are going to be many miles apart so that they are in different geographical fault areas. In, in essence, if there were to be a flood, it would only affect one AZ and not multiple. If there were going to be an earthquake, it would affect one AZ and not multiple. And so the whole point here is to isolate any failure into a subset of components and then architect in the resiliency across those availability zones and other components. So that way we can continue to have uh, an operational workload even when our components fail. So let's move on to reliability 12. And this is all about testing our reliability, right? So it's all well and good to have a plan and it's all well and good to figure out exactly what we're gonna do if something does fail. But we need to test that. And the way that we do that is by simulating failure modes. We're going to do test scaling, performance, and processes. And the way that all of those things are going to happen is when we do a simulated failure, as we go through the runbook of what we would do in that scenario, it's going to test the scaling, performance, and processes for us. And we're going to find out where the hidden gotchas might be that we had never even considered. Because the time to figure out whether or not your recovery processes are going to work is not when you're in the middle of a failure. So as a result, we have our disaster recovery. We have our, our plans, right? And the, the first thing you have to do with disaster recovery is you have to figure out what the business objectives are. So we start again with the business and we, we talk about the operational workload, and what our objectives should be in the, in the instance of a disaster. 
And by that, we're talking about a recovery point objection, objective and a recovery time objective. So what that means is as we have an outage, how much time can this workload sustain before it needs to be operational again? Obviously, we'd always love to have zero time, but some things can withstand some semblance of outage and still be an acceptable threshold, and some things cannot. So we want to decide what is that time period that our workload can be down and still be acceptable, and then that's the recovery time objective. The recovery point objective is if I do have an outage, and let's say it happens at noon today, how far back can I have data loss before I need to make sure that everything is there? In other words, if I have an outage and I lose all of my data set for one day, is that acceptable? In some scenarios, it would be because the data hasn't changed that much. In some scenarios, it absolutely would not be acceptable. And so that's our recovery point objective. How far back in time can I go and find an acceptable data set? So we have a recovery time objective and our recovery point objective. So the first thing we do is we have to set those and then we go ahead and plan for those. Now we're going to move on to chaos engineering. This is a scientific method for gathering data. And the way that it starts is you start with a steady state. This is something that you have a high confidence level of your, your availability. So we want to know this is something that's working. We're very confident that it's going to work. It's what we call our steady state. Then we're going to take a hypothesis. So we're going to assume something, whether that be an outage, some kind of failure, and that will be what we want to test. And then in order to test that, we're going to run an experiment. This might be a, a failure injection simulator. It might be something else. But it's some method for us to experiment on whether or not our hypothesis will happen as planned based on the architectures we've set out. And then we're going to see what happens. That's the verify state. So either everything's going to go as we thought it would, and we're going to verify that we have a good process for recovery, or we're going to learn that there were some outages that we didn't expect or some unintended consequences. And based on that, we're going to have areas that we could improve, and we're going to go ahead and, and work on the implementation of that improvement. Once we've implemented those improvements, what we've done is we've created a new steady state. We have a new high confidence level for, for our uh, uptime, right, our availability, and then that's our new steady state, and then we can go through the process again. So the way that we talked about game days, right, game days, we talked about how do we how do we test our processes? And so a game day is how we do it. It's a simulated failure or an event to test system resiliency, the processes, and team responses. Now, this is really important because as we look at this, what we're showing on the screen right now is the things you do ahead of time. Right, we do our planning, we're coming up with our hypothesis, we're talking about running an experiment, and then doing some analysis of what, what we think is going to happen. But as we click through this slide, we're going to see there's actually a lot more to it because it's not just the technology, it's the people and processes as well as the technology. So we want to make sure that we're looking cross discipline who are all the people and teams that might be involved in this workload should something have to have to be done should we have an outage and we need to recover from it and then what are their processes to have that happen for example many times we we look through things we see people go ahead and make a plan that has a communication mechanism where there's a key stakeholder involved that has to make an approval process or make something happen and that looks great when it's daytime and we're walking through it but if we do an actual simulation at nighttime sometimes you'll find that your processes involve contacting somebody who may or may not be as readily available at night as they were during the day. For example, a key stakeholder, when they go to sleep, they might put their phone on silent or they might turn it off altogether so they can get a good night's sleep. Well, that might severely uh, put, a, put a, a delay in our process. There might be a many hour delay in our recovery process because a key stakeholder is not available. Those are great things that come out during a simulated failure so that we can rectify those and make sure we're not going to have that problem when there's when there's an actual uh, business impact. So talking a little bit more about the strategies we were talking about for disaster recovery, right? We talked about recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives. 
And so how do we work through all of that? Well, this slide starts to, to help us to kind of discern where we need to be, where the business needs to be. And there's two kinds. There's an active passive where we have one set that we're using when everything is fine. And then there's a, a passive subset of infrastructure that we're going to fail over to. Or there's also an active active where you're utilizing both of them all the time. So let's dig a little bit into that. So backup and restore. This starts on the far left of this chart. You're going to see we're going to see different objectives or different architectures that we can do. And they're going to go from left to right, from lowest cost to highest cost. But you'll also notice that from left to right, they're going to go from the highest, uh, highest number of hours or minutes or basically time, the highest time for a recovery point objective and a recovery time objective. All the way as we increase cost, we're going to lower those time thresholds. So starting with backup and restore, we basically have something we're backing up. And whenever there's an outage, we're going to begin creating a new, uh, a new environment of that through restoring. And that's going to take time, but it's only running when we need it. And so it's the lowest amount of cost. Moving on to the right side, we're going to see a pilot light, which is essentially I'm going to lower my time from hours to maybe tens of minutes. I'm going to already have my data replicated to my new environment but I'm not going to have the environment spun up. So it's not going to cost me as much as it would to have a full copy of my environment. Uh, and the data is already replicated. So I'm starting to save some time and plan, but there is more cost associated. Moving to a warm standby, my data is live. It's replicated like it was before. Uh, and I've got some infrastructure that's running. So I've got a small subset of my, my environment architecture running. So we've added some cost because of that but it's not a full scale model. So there will be some time that I'll still need to scale that out. And so that will increase the, that's why we still have some minutes left. And then we move to a multi-site active active. This is the best case scenario as far as the recovery point objective and the recovery time objective, because we're always live and our data is gonna be near real time. And our recovery time objective, because it's already live. So the failover, um, it doesn't take any time to happen. But there is a lot more cost involved because you have more resources running all the time. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Seth for the, the demo that I promised you like 40 minutes ago. He's going to show you some really cool things that you can do and show you how to do it. Sure. Yeah. Regarding, regarding chaos engineering, that's a really uh, popular area we love to talk about. So we have a, a demo there if you want to. Uh, take down that link or, or snap that QR code there. It's based on one of our well-architected labs. So the demo is going to walk you through a part of that lab. So without further ado, here it is. All right. What you see here is we have three EC2 instances, one in each availability zone, one in A, one in B, one in C. This is our reference architecture. And you can see each EC2 instance has its own instance ID. Now, our reference architecture is serving a very simple website. This picture is being served from the S3 bucket. And up here is some metadata. And I want you to look at where it says availability zone. As I refresh that, you see it goes from A to C to B to A. So each request is going to a different EC2 instance, one of the three EC2 in instances in zone A, in zone B, or zone C. This is again as, as expected and as designed. So we're going to try a test. Uh, we're going to uh, and try an experiment where we're going to fail one of the instances. So we'll run fail instance. And it's going to tell me it wants a VPC ID. That's fine. We'll give it a VPC ID. Uh, all three EC2 instances are in the same VPC. And what's it going to do? You can see it says terminating this instance ID. Let's look at the last 76F. It, it terminated 76F. So we see 76F. That's the one in zone A. And if I refresh, it's now showing 76F in zone A is shutting down. This is as expected. Our We uh, simulated the failure of an EC2 instance by shutting it down. That's what our little script did. So as we refresh this, you'll see it goes from a shutting down state and it, uh, well, let's go check our website actually. So our website here, we're gonna refresh the site and you're gonna see it's hitting zone B and C, zone B and C. That's exactly what we'd expect. There's no loss of availability. And even though the instance in A has failed, it's hitting zone B and C. And why is that? This here is our elastic load balancer. And you can see that it has as registered targets, just B and C. A has been deregistered because it was deemed unhealthy. 
over here is our auto scaling group. Our auto scaling group is configured to maintain three instances at all time. So it sees that the one in A is terminating. So what's it going to do? It's going to spin up another instance to replace that instance in zone A. So if we go here and refresh, you'll see this one's terminated. And the uh, auto scaling group, as soon as it, um, there it goes. You see pending in A, zone, the one in terminated in A here, and there's one pending in A here. In the meantime, traffic is still being served from B and C. Let's take a quick look at the code. Okay, so this is our fail instance code. This is available on GitHub uh, at the link I gave you. And the first part here is just the part you saw where it asked for a VPC ID. And the rest of it's very simple. It's using the AWS CLI, the command line interface. Here it's doing a describe instances given the VPC ID I gave it, and it's parsing out the first instance return. That's non-deterministic, so it's sort of random. And with that first instance determined, it's do with that first instance that's returned, it's doing an EC2 terminate instances. So find the first instance that you returned to me in the VPC and terminate it. And that's exactly what we saw going on here. So now this new one is spinning up and it's initializing. And it'll take about a minute or so to initialize. So what I'm going to do is stop the recording and bring it back after it's initialized in about a minute or so. So it's been about one minute since I stopped the recording before, and now you can see that new instance that was started in zone A, because we killed one in zone A, and started a new one in zone A, is now running and healthy. So if we go here over to the page, and again, look at the availability zone here, and I refresh, you can see now it's going to A, B, and C. And so our hypothesis was that steady state would be uh, would continue, that there would be no availability loss, and that it would replace the lost instance. So all of these came true, so our hypothesis is confirmed for killing an EC2 instance. Now let's try a slightly more advanced experiment. So before we killed an instance, so now we're going to fail an entire availability zone. So we're going to simulate the failure of an availability zone, and you can see it wants a couple of arguments. It wants a... Um, um, it wants a availability zone, and it wants that VPC ID. So we're going to give it both of those. And what it's doing here, you can see it says ACL here. That's access control list. So what it's doing is setting up an access control list on the subnets in availability zone C that is denying all traffic in and out of the subnet. That is how we are simulating failure of the subnet by um, shutting off all traffic going in and out of the subnet. So now if we come here, it's uh, zone C that we failed, and we refresh it, what you'll see is the one in zone C shows as healthy, but it's not really healthy, and I'll get back to that in a second. And our system recognizes that, so it's starting up a new instance in zone A. It's not going to start it up in zone C because it knows the availability zone C has failed. So it's going to start it up in zone A instead to maintain those three instances. Now, why does this show healthy? This is where our simulation and reality diverge a little. Our simulation is using networking to shut off all traffic in and out of that subnet. But within that subnet, the actual shallow checks that are shown here are actually still operating and say it's healthy our deeper health checks that are actually used by our um, load balancer and by our auto scaling group, these deeper health checks actually call the web app. Those recognize that it's not healthy and that's why it's starting up a new instance here to maintain three instances. So if I come to the website here and refresh it, then what do we see? We see it's hitting zone A. I'm going to refresh it. It's hitting zone A and B. This is as expected because zone C has been taken out of commission. So what's happened is there's no availability loss. We killed the entire zone C. Traffic is being taken by zone A and zone B, and that we're spinning up a new instance here so that we maintain three healthy instances. Again, our hypothesis is confirmed. All right, yeah, and, and just to show you how we might do that with FIS, which was launched last year, the AWS Vault Injection Simulator, which was the show last week. So if you haven't seen that show, go back and watch it. Uh, we're going to share this uh, other conclusion to the demo. Okay, what you see here is we have three uh, running web servers. All three of them are running. We go to our application. We see it's using uh, availability zone C. I'll refresh. There's A, there's B, there's C. All right, so it's using all A, B, and C. So here we are in FIS, uh, and this is showing an experiment template. So in this template, I've told it I want to terminate, use the terminate instance action, 
And what I want to target is EC2 instances, one of them, only one of them, with this tag. So the CloudFormation stack name equals web service for resiliency. That is the tag on these instances. If I go to these instances here and show you the tags, there's that tag right there. Um, so I want to get one of those and only if it's running. So you notice I have one from a previous experiment that's terminated. You know, I don't want it to mess around with that. I just want it to hit the ones that are running. So what I'll do is I'll go action, start, and it's saying, okay, I can add tags to the experiment. I can say start experiment. And now it's chaos testing. We want to make sure that you really want to do this. So we're going to hit start and it's going to run the experiment now. So we successfully started the experiment. Terminate instance pending. I can refresh this and now it's completed. Okay. So now if we go back here to the instances and I refresh them, see one of them is shutting down, the one in USEC. And if I go back to our app and I go ahead and refresh that, it's hitting zone B, zone A, zone A and zone B. Okay. So that's what we expected. And it works very similar to our terminate EC2 instance script, but now it's using a, the FIS service to do that. All right, awesome. So just so you know, the reason we did the script first is script is a great way to onboard and, and do chaos testing without fear because you understand exactly what's happening. There's It's all transparent. And then move to FIS because that's the native AWS way to do it, integrated with AWS security and, and guardrails. Um, so just real quick takeaways here is you get reliability, reliability is going to be a continuous improvement process. You can't just do it just once, even though we're providing check boxes in the law architecture tool, it's not a one and done. And you have to test it. As Johnny said, if you don't test it, you don't test your reliability plan, you don't have a reliability plan. Prepare for the worst, defense and layers, understand what your business needs and what kind of uh, failures you're, you're, you can tolerate and can't tolerate and prepare for those and get started with those best practices we mentioned today, which you can learn about by looking in the uh, well architected reliability pillar. Um, all these links here, links to the labs, links to FIS are gonna be included in the chat live today or in the details where you're watching this VOD later, let's say on YouTube. And with that, we thank you very much. Thank you, Seth and Johnny, for the awesome content. Um, if there are questions that we are not answered today, you can post your question on repost.aws and email us any feedback to AWS supports you at amazon.com. We want to hear from you and tell us what else you would like to see on this show. Again, thank you for your question. Thank you for joining us at AWS support you and the happy cloud computing. Have a nice day. Bye.